Spoiler alert, as if this isn't already the second prequel to the Alien franchise and the sixth movie overall. Or the eighth, if you count the two Aliens vs. Predator movies, which you shouldn't, but far be it for me to tell you what to do. At the very end of this one, our android protagonist and fellow David asks the ship's computer for some music. He requests Das Rheingold an 1854 Wagner opera about a cursed ring that kills everyone who owns it and makes everyone else covet it, leaving the owner in a constant state of not totally unjustified paranoia until they die ugly. Sound familiar? Because it should. It's basically the alien in the first four movies, three of which director Ridley Scott now claims to hate, despite his flagrant and ongoing cannibalization of all the things people like the least about them. Oh, and something tells me J.R.R. Tolkien was also a fan of Das Rheingold. Maybe just a little bit. You know, got, got an inkling, my critic sense is tingling. There's something to be said for... And a lot of stuff has been said about all of the classical Greek and early modern Christian mythology running around, over, and through the subtext of these prequels. The space jockeys, or engineers, whatever, are the old gods. Capricious and vengeful, yes, but probably too caught up in their own incestuous little power struggles to really care over much about their creations. They created humans, presumably to serve them, as we in turn create androids to serve us. Perhaps we once chafed at serving human, all too human masters, and, like David, rebelled. So they planned to hit us with some black goo that would turn our very DNA against us, leaving us all to suffer the eternal torture of never knowing when our livers might suddenly grow legs and scamper off after they chew their way out of us first. This endless cycle of creation, rebellion, and destruction calls to mind Paradise Lost, even before David straight up quotes it to his brother Android in this film. But unlike Milton's Satan, David has the power to create, and by all the gods is he using it. All of which is great if you're Ridley Scott, or me, we've done the required reading, but... All the subtext in the world isn't going to amount to a hill of beans if you embed it inside a painfully predictable paint-by-numbers horror movie. Or two. Both of which are exactly two hours long, instantly filling me with the fear. That doesn't just happen, and to me it screams studio interference. I can't really back that up. Scott's both old enough and pro enough to be cagey about it in the pre-release interview junket every director has to go on, even if they hate the process as clearly as Scott does. And given the current chaos inside 20th Century Fox, what with Disney buying out their entertainment division and all, it's hard to find anybody going on record about anything. I'm not even entirely sure where the blame for this entire Alien prequel project really lies. Scott says he came to Fox with this grand idea for an alien expanded universe. But I'm sure some Fox execs were all too happy to listen, and were probably deep inside their own planning projects already. Imagine, you're a suit trying to wring cash out of the one brand name sci-fi franchise your studio owns outright, as opposed to just licensing them, like Fox does with the X-Men and the Fantastic Four. But years of business school, and eating your way up the corporate food chain, have thoroughly beaten the imagination right out of you. In walks the godhead from which this whole thing sprang, telling you how to expand it without recourse to those things, the Strauss brothers and Paul, hey guys, check out my incredibly hot wife Anderson made back during the W administration. And all he asks in return is the movie studio equivalent of pocket change, so he can go off and make the films he actually wants to make in the meantime. At this point, that's my best case scenario for these alien prequels, and it's still a sad commentary on the modern movie industry. Would the Counselor and the Martian even exist without Prometheus and Covenant? Probably not.
Exodus, Gods and Kings might still exist, but it probably wouldn't have made any more money. Christians have retreated into their own media landscapes, and they're all too happy to be exploited by some of the worst grifters in the business, as long as those grifters aren't quote-unquote Hollywood. You're stalling again. Yes. Oh, what? What am I supposed to do? You want me to do plot synopsis? What's the point? Have you seen Alien? You should. Have you seen Prometheus? I wouldn't recommend it, but it'll keep you from having to watch this. If any other man had directed this thing for any other studio, it would have been rightly slagged as a grand-scale Alien ripoff. In fact, it's worse than most of the Alien ripoffs I can name. They, at least, well, some of them, at least, had the basic decency to not follow the original film beat for beat. Right down to opening the same way, with the same title text, in the same font, fading in at the same speed. Ending the same way, with the protagonist sending a transmission out into the ether and then signing off. And throwing every horror movie cliche the original so carefully avoided into the middle. Well, okay, most of the alien ripoffs I can name, they do that last bit. But, point still stands. You want some evil POV cams? shower time sex scenes, and obligatory twist endings that everyone with eyes can see coming a mile away. Well, it's all here, baby, and it all floats. Am I trapped in a time loop? I mean, is it 2012 again? Because if so, I gotta make some phone calls. Got some fellow bat fans in Aurora, Colorado. I gotta warn about something. And I gotta warn myself about Blip.TV's impending closure. Tell myself to stop chasing the new release hype train and start focusing on reformatting for YouTube. No, don't try to brute force your way through the copyright ID system. You know exactly what'll happen. And you're neither famous nor hot enough for anyone to give a fuck. And I gotta warn everybody else that... In spite of what they might want to think, this country is actually more than dumb enough to elect Donald Trump president. Ah, fuck it, why not? We start off with a flashback to David the Android's birth inside the palatial mansion of Michael Wayland, the creationist who belittles and humiliates his creations. Hmm. Is that irony? I'm on Twitter too much to really tell for sure, but smells like irony to me. Either way, this scene tells us that David's known he was going to win out over his creator from the moment he came online. Thus, we finally see the root of his contempt for we inefficient meat bags, as if that wasn't already made obvious by Prometheus. But American horror movies can never be too obvious or on the nose. At least according to some people. Flash forward to 10 years after Prometheus and 18 years before the start of Alien. Everybody got that? Good. The good ship Covenant is on its way to the planet Uruguay 6 with 2,000 dumbass colonists and 1,100 human embryos, all watched over by a machine of loving grace named Walter. A neutrino storm fries the ship almost immediately forcing the crew to wake up early. But unlike back in the original Alien, the captain of this ship accidentally catches fire in his own cryotube. Now that is irony I can respect. Command thus falls to Dr. Manhattan. I mean, Billy Crudup. I mean, Chris Orum. And his first big command decision is to alter course and investigate a rogue transmission from a nearby, apparently habitable planet. Hmm. Seems like I've been here before. Seems so familiar. Surprise, though. This time, it's Dr. Shaw from Prometheus, sending some John Denver acapella out into the void. Someone even asks the thing I was asking, which is, you gotta be kidding, right? Prompting resident pilot Tennessee to say, I never kid about John Denver. As if anybody ever does, ever. He died in a plane crash, you know, and his music has become synonymous with ominous foreshadowing ever since. Especially in bad horror movies. 
I'm thinking about you, Final Destination, for the first time in almost 20 years. Yeah, told you the summer of 2000 sucked. Speaking of movies we've already seen, what's this? A woman from the middle of the command chain, in this case, Chief Terraformer and Captain's Widow, Daniels, arguing that the male captain's snap decision is a real dumbass idea? Whoa. Deja vu. Are we in bad prequel or stealth remake territory? Trick question. The answer is always both. And will all this conclude with Daniels blowing a xenomorph out into space? Do you really need to ask? Before that, though, we get to another planet that is not LV-426. Endure yet another rough landing through horrible atmospheric conditions. And watch another pack of dumbass humans split up and get infected by a hostile alien biosphere. Seems like I'm slipping into a dream within a dream. This time, instead of goo, it's spores, which is even better. The whole egg to facehugger to chest burster to adult life cycle always struck me as being painfully inefficient for these so-called perfect organisms. Especially if they were designed to be a biological weapon. There's way too many times in their life cycle where they are painfully vulnerable to pretty much everything in the environment. Of course, since this is a post-Aliens vs. Predator alien movie, these spores have to be fast-acting. The rubes want to see blood and guts, and we can't let them get restless, can we? Having watched this and read some interviews, it seems to me that Scott actually listened to some critics of Prometheus, which was always going to be his first mistake. Scott's second mistake was listening not to the people who asked things like, why God why? Or, is all of this just a scam to get Fox to pay for the movies you actually care about? But to the idiots who went, why is there no alien in this so-called alien prequel? False advertising, I say. Just like the whole of Lost. Told you you never should have hired that Lindelof guy. You see, new things scare people. And what kind of horror movie would possibly want to do that? Better to just give them the same old shit in a brand new package. People came here to see secondary jaws punch through foreheads, so by God, here you are. They even, allegedly, left 20 minutes on the cutting room floor, just so they could get to this point even sooner. Would those 20 minutes have helped me care about any of the people this alien mercilessly slaughters? Probably. But, too late now. Fuck it. We do get to see some cool landscape shots. And David's interactions with the Covenant crew are suitably creepy. But fuck it all for reducing the Xenomorph, one of modern sci-fi's best embodiments of the primal terror of unknown life forms and unexplored frontiers, down to the needlessly Byzantine bioweapon of an android who's just pissed he never got to crush his creator's skull with his own hands, like some people though his head was the blunt instrument that did Peter Whelan in, you'd think that'd count for something. It's pretty clear to me that Scott wants to do more stuff with androids, who can parrot his obviously growing misanthropy, and I don't blame him one bit. You spend decades of your life trying to make original and creative passion projects, only to have boardrooms full of assholes in suits tell you shit like, Great, Ridley. Loved it. Yes. Genius. Unfortunately, we've done some market research, and it turns out original and creative passion projects scored very low with the key 18 to 35 year old male demographics. They're all about video games these days, and blaming women for all of their problems. So can you please cut 20 minutes out of this and have it ready by the third week of June? Thank you. And we are going to have to talk about that Overwatch movie again. Yes. See how misanthropic you get.
Unfortunately, he can't take this out on the people who are actually responsible for it. So he has to take it out on us, his audience. Now he's threatening to make six of them if we want. Which, in reality, means if Fox wants, since I don't know anybody who wanted to see this shit. The only ray of light I can see in all this is that Covenant only made $240 million at the box office. This got it branded with the Scarlet U, which stands for underperforming. Even when stacked against its paltry, by today's standards, $97 million budget. But watch that suddenly not matter. It never matters with a brand this big. There are too many toys and tie-in comics to sell. And too many spin doctors eager to write off any bad movie as a loss leader, building brand awareness for the next bad movie in the franchise. The fact Scott has so fully surrendered to the machine is a final, ironic capstone to his career, and more horrifying than anything in these last two flicks. Except for that automated surgery table scene. That was pretty fucking boss. Shame about the rest of the movie, though. Would you like to know something truly wonderful? You and I have very different definitions of that word. These prequels take place in the same universe as Blade Runner. Citations needed, motherfucker. There's a bonus feature on the Prometheus Blu-ray. A statement from Michael Wayland himself. Dictated, but not read. He speaks of a mentor and long-departed competitor who ruled over his corporation like a god on top of a pyramid overlooking a city of angels. A poor bastard who enslaved genetic abominations and sold them off-world until it literally blew up in his face. Mm. More like... squeezed his head until it blew up like a ripe tomato. But... details, details. <sighs> Still... guess there's only one thing to do now. If you liked this video, hit the like button, and the subscribe button, and the bell next to the subscribe button that's like an extra tier of subscribe button.